This is the European edition of Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. We bring you the European unicorn startups, founders, regulators and leaders innovating the rapidly evolving fintech scene today. A truly localized podcast with both English and local language content with some of the world's most well-known hosts and influencers in the fintech sector globally. Join us every week as we explore what makes the European Union a phenomenal proving ground for many of the fastest growing fintech plays in the world today. Okay, let's roll. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Breaking Back Europe. This is Roberto Caputici, your host. Today, we have an exceptional guest, Mr. Jahed Moman from Barcelona, Spain. And what we're talking today about, uh, yeah, again, we're talking about carbon, carbon credits, uh, and all these things that are green, right? It is green impact, green, green like the walls behind <laughs> our mm-hmm. guest is ahead. But now, today, we are talking about the color blue. Because, uh, and it's going to be a beautiful discovery for many people, there is more assortion of... Uh, uh, carbon that is captured by things in the sea compared to those uh, captured in the forest. And this is really a revelation for me. I haven't thought about it. You think that uh, we breathe thanks to the tree that produce, you know, like uh, oxygen for us, but there are algae and there are a lot of plants in the sea that do a much better work. So those get monetized as well uh, in terms of uh, the work they do and the space uh, that, uh, uh, you know, they take. uh, And we're going to discuss this. So welcome uh, to Breaking Back Europe, uh, Jahed. You can give us a little bit of introduction about yourself and how you find yourself into the blue carbon uh, uh, board. Definitely. Thank you for having me. Um, so I, I run a venture fund called Cerulean Ventures, which is just the combination of blue and green. <laughs> Actually, if you end up going to the website, uh, that's what the color means. And we basically are interested in uh, creating planetary scale regeneration and climate impact through nature markets and energy markets. And so uh, we came to this space, basically, my partner and I have been in this space for about seven years. Um uh, collectively, we've been looking at, uh, we both started in tech and open source software and blockchain. And we very much saw an opportunity here, you know, on the fintech side, because like you said, there's, um, there is a lot of interest in carbon and carbon credits and carbon capture, because we're in a context where if you haven't been paying attention, there's a, there's a freaking heat wave in Europe right now. I'm sweating. I don't know if we use the video for this thing, but I cannot stop sweating here. It's like 70% humidity and 30 degrees Celsius. Um, but anyway, why why is blue carbon important for all this stuff, right? Well, basically, we um, if you look, like you said, 90% of the world's carbon is actually stored in the ocean, depending on the U.S. There's a number of studies on this, 80 to 90% of it. And it's stored in a various number of ways it actually it can be stored even by the creatures in it right like whales capture a ton of carbon actually when they die and sink to the bottom of the ocean so that's actually one way we've seen some crazy ideas out there where people are like if we protect whales we can sequester more carbon in the oceans but um, but anyway we, we got into the space because we we're looking at how to use fintech to scale the adoption of blue green uh, carbon protect biodiversity protect topsoils and a number of other things I just, that's a, that's an interesting, there are so many questions that pops to mind because uh, when it comes to a forest, uh, that's very well assigned. The forest belongs to a government, uh, belongs to a private uh, corporation, uh, so it's very tangible, uh, the square uh, kilometers, uh, and uh, you can uh, make an easy calculation on how uh, this is contributing, not cutting down them uh, rather than planting more. So what are the activities and how you can uh, assess uh, the benefits, the the benefits of uh, blue uh, carbon collection, right? Well, there's that's one of the reasons why you're seeing a blue carbon projects are still less common than land based ones. It's because this measurement, reporting, and verification, which is uh, known as MRV um, in in the field, uh, it's more challenging with blue carbon projects, right? There are there are dozens and dozens and dozens of companies, standards, scientific papers published on 
um, arboreal MRV measuring forest uh, carbon capture, right? And then measuring that in an ongoing way, reporting and verifying it. There are standards that have been built around additionality, around, you know, um, other, and I can define some of these terms if people aren't familiar with them, but basically um, that stuff is way more advanced. We know far less about ocean carbon, uh, and but we do know that in total there's more more of it more of it is stored there right so like coastal ecosystems tidal marshes mangrove seagrasses they can capture and store carbon at a rate up to six times higher than mature tropical forests right and there's published work on that the problem is that when you begin to insert uh, financial dynamics into it you need to be able to tell a customer who's paid for an outcome how much of it can i claim this year how much of it can i retire right, right? if you're if you're familiar with how carbon credits work right and so um you know, people have their net zero commitments or they're in the compliance carbon markets and they have to actually emit less. And so they're looking for ways to emit more if they're in the compliance markets. And then if they do that, they have to find a way to actually offset that in a trusted way, because if you're in the regulated market, you can't mess around with that stuff. Right. Just for everybody else that is listening or watching us now and are a little bit confused with the whole thing, you know, the impact of uh, uh, you know pollution rather than uh, cleaning the air that is uh, being measured and collected. Uh, so there are places and countries and uh, operations or uh, that have a positive impact and those that have a negative impact. So uh, those that have a negative impact, they need to pay to contribute on the positive side in order to balance out their damage. Right. So yeah. this is pretty much in very short. Uh, and now I wonder with this uh, with this blue carbon, people can say, "Hey, I'm polluting, but the sea is uh, taking care of uh, but counterbalancing me, right?" So, yeah, uh, who has the right to claim this 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 aspect? Oh. Well, you asked an interesting question. The rights go to a lot of things, right? It's easy. I was at a conference recently, actually in Lisbon, um, the Economist Impact Summit on a World Ocean Summit, right? And there was, a, there was a person that actually, I'm not going to name too many names. I don't remember what the rules were <laughs> on that, but I'll just say that it's one of the world's largest banks and one of the world's largest banks and insurers, chief sustainability officers. And one of their key points was that um, the reason why they haven't made an ocean investment yet is because the provenance of ownership on right. land is very simple. They own the asset. They own the thing that is underneath right. it. They can claim that. With the ocean, the oceans are what are under what's known as um, commons-based governance, right? So, uh, they we have three types broadly, right? There's there's a global commons-based governance. There's private there's private property rights. There's public property rights. Public is the government. Private is private individual or corporation who buys it. Commons is actually what the you know the UN and other global international NGOs and bodies that say you know, going out to this point from your coast is where your, you know, if you're America or Canada, what have you, your coastline ends here, the rest of it is commonly governed. International world. Exactly. And so that in this context, the Economist Impact Summit was really being positioned as something that was a problem. Whereas, you know, I asked the question, you know, being the kind of kind of person I am, I was like, "Well, are you arguing that we should have private ownership of all the oceans?" <laughs> right. I, I, I was thinking, <laughs> as you were talking, I was thinking to set up a website to make a small grid around all the ocean and start selling the NFT for each square yeah. kilometer of ocean, yeah, exactly. uh, so people can yeah. contribute uh, and yeah. uh, own uh, a piece of it. In in fact, that's. Uh, Probably it should counterweight uh, for everybody in equal parts of land. I don't know. That's that's an interesting aspect. If yeah. you're a fisher, I would trust that. If you're in fishery, if you're in um, you know aquaculture, these things. If you're just some person off the internet buying stuff, I don't really think it's going right. to do anything. <laughs> in <laughs> fact, I was <laughs> ironic. I didn't mean it for real, right? <laughs> oh, it's funny you mentioned that though, because I see people like this idea all the time, and I think it will happen. I think it could be good. It's just about how well done it is, right? Because I don't think we should be on the other side of this, where uh, you know the oceans are owned by Nestle, Bechtel, and like a couple other folks who, because at that point, if you haven't built a system that also holds them accountable for the environmental costs that they freely impose on everybody, then you're just going to have the private right to pollute, which is what you have on the land, right? Right, <laughs> correct. Because in fact, at the beginning, I told you, if, if we're talking about lakes, there are very huge lakes, that's easier to measure yeah. and to assess, but the oceans yeah. are uh, something something more difficult. For sure. Uh, 
So yeah, in fact, the 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 all all the questions that can come to mind are really putting next to each other uh, green carbon credit, blue carbon credits in terms of uh, how they they exchange. Uh, it's funny because in the crypto world, whatever was uh, a token uh, were were called were called color coins, right? So oh, yeah, I'm wondering that was, that was old school. Yeah, that was like right, 10, uh, 10, 10, 11. Yeah, I don't know. I'm that. wondering if it is this carbon credit we are entering the phase of the color coins as well in terms of uh, how many other uh, measurement. Uh, probably the stratosphere in a certain point is contributing in a certain well, way. So you're gonna have uh, I can that one as well, right? Uh, I can than, definitely uh, fill in a little bit of um, details on that so like Please. right now one of the main problems with the carbon markets with is that they the voluntary carbon markets is that it's somewhat difficult to get ongoing quality data about the quality uh, well, ongoing quality data about the efficacy of a carbon credit so like basically um i i buy some credits in year three or four of a project i need to you know i don't really it's hard for me to get feedback on like did, did this did this carbon that was up in the air actually end up somewhere right um and so the problem with vcm is that a lot of people are trying to treat we think you know we think uh, I, i'm now speaking like for our fund right is that uh people think that carbon is can be made very fungible we think it can be but there's going to be some extent to which it's always semi-fungible it's not carbon here we're already talking about green and carbon green and blue right. carbon that's a great example but there are other methodologies like biochar um direct air capture there's all these other various things where and enhanced rock weathering which you haven't even touched on and they have different yield curves. And what I mean by that is like, if you're, if you're coming from crypto, right? Like what does the yield curve look like for Uniswap or even something better, sushi swap? Like what did you get from fees when you started staking mm -hmm. your sushi swap versus Uniswap? They're totally different because one pays fees and the other one doesn't, mm -hmm. right? And so if I look at something like a forest, when you plant a forest, I don't know if you guys use video, maybe you can see my finger tracing an S in the air. Mm -hmm. um when you plant a forest for the first few years it kind of just trots along it doesn't really capture much then when it starts to mature it goes hugely up like this and then when it, be, when it matures fully it goes back to just kind of being a little bit flat and increasing however when you look at something like biochar it's a linear curve it just keeps going up like this so we we trade these often it's hard for us in the markets to say like uh what's the worth of this biochar project at year five versus this other this nature-based tree you know forest project at year seven mm -hmm. that's a really hard thing a really hard trade to make but we should be able to do it right and now you're talking about blue carbon i'm gonna even, I, I have to go and read some of the science i'm sure someone listening is gonna be like that guy's an idiot doesn't know it <laughs> but like basically blue carbon kelp forests and all this stuff we have no idea like what what this looks like when you want to marketize it put it out there on the market right it's not stopping people from doing it which i don't think it should but the point with this is that when you compare blue and green carbon, you really have to look at how what rate are they capturing it if they can if they can capture it at a six times higher rate than tropical forest, like the figure I talked about earlier in the pod. That's fantastic. It's great news. Great news for all of us who are sweating <laughs> right, right now, right? But we also need to know how much, like how quickly that is and how fast can we can scale it. And fintech, blockchain, normal, normal old TradFi. These are the questions we need to be able to answer so that we can put more money in these systems and get uh, more money out of them on the back end with the climate impact. Do you think uh, also now, because 2023 is the year of artificial intelligence, right? Uh, or, or human dumbness, if you want, on the other side. <laughs> uh, are there model, uh, are there model of uh, uh, artificial intelligence that can help uh, uh, to measure and uh, understand the, the distribution of, of this because I would think that uh, um, an algorithm that has uh, maybe a certain set of inputs satellite pictures rather than uh, others probably uh, would be the, the most fair methodology <laughs> to, to value things well yes and no because the, it's actually really difficult to do so and I think that the generative approaches that are super sexy and getting all the attention uh are going to be pretty difficult to apply here there's a different there's a different school a different tract within ai called causal ai who that that those forms and methodologies of ai are really trying to understand what causes what and so there's this there's a solution concept in um this is a different field game theory called the shapley value and this is a really interesting concept when it's applied to forests because basically the shapley value is um 
essentially it if you're dealing with a cooperative game and there's a there's a surplus generated by a bunch of players in the game the shapley value lets you kind of say who did what it lets you kind of okay. give you one you know how important is each player to this game and what payoff can they reasonably expect right and so any ai uh, approach that can sort of map a shapley value as a contributor in a in an ecosystem game is really the way you want to be doing this because okay. then you can because if you think about a nature-based solution let's talk about green credits right there's a lot of players involved but the ones who really matter are who planted the trees where did they plant them <laughs> when did they plant them when did they measure them did they right. take any other actions to support them and then you can actually say great what was their contribution to this right and then if you think about that, I just talked about the people doing the project. What if I also want to include what it what if rainfall is a right. part of the, is, is is a variable in the right. game? What if biodiversity, soil health, and soil quality are without uh, counting the extension of the space that you have to yeah. control because one exactly. forest is small yeah. compared this, to the ocean, right? Exactly. So, yeah. The forest one is already super complicated, but you can see that you it's not as simple as feeding a model a a bunch of data and saying and giving it a token and saying what comes next <laughs> right? right like that's right. a totally different thing um but i don't i don't i don't doubt that we can do this there are already people working on this and we're working with some of them to figure this out so my intention to take all my house plant and throw them in my swimming pool and try to catch some money is not to be taken in consideration i think <laughs> no yeah point. but if you get if you get some kelp powder maybe you can do that if you get some right. kelp going that that might be helpful it is, uh, yeah, it is uh, something that, uh, to be honest, I'm, I, I am like a computer scientist, uh, a cryptographer, I do have a large interest and uh, I'm a blockchain person. Uh, I am entering this world of uh, the impact uh, on, uh, on, on the planet and uh, the monetization of this impact uh, since recently. So I am quite illiterate in these things. And this uh, conversation helped me to uh, understand and learn as much as I hope all the people listening to us are having this opportunity uh, as well. Uh, you know, what is your vision for uh, um, more technological and uh, wise uh, in terms of a human uh, take on life future oh. uh, where things things can be put to play in the proper way? Well, I think like we we're never going to be I, I hope someone there's a there's a betting market or prediction market on this so people can bet on this, but I'll probably be wrong. But I think that we're never going to be able to fully understand every single thing that's going on in nature in a reductionist way that we kind of, you know, we'll be able to work backwards from all the variables and say, this is how it works. But that does, I don't really think that's where the innovation needs to be. Where I'm, this is a FinTech podcast. I actually think what we need to be able to, be, to do is if we look at stuff like blue carbon and green carbon at a macro level, at an outcome level, we know this stuff works. I know that if I plant a tree, it uses carbon to grow I don't need to know exactly how much at what time. Same thing for blue carbon. I know kelp forests do things. I know when a whale, if I protect whales longer, they, they take in more carbon, they die, they go to the bottom of the ocean, they trap carbon. So what we really need to find is what is the overlap between our financial system and these nature-based solutions. And we need to be able to finance them, right? Because the problem with this stuff right now is that if I want to do a blue carbon project, um, I it's extremely expensive, right? Mm. At its core, you need forward contracts that pay for development costs right away. And then those forward contracts also would secure access to future carbon credits at a discount, right? right? This is where now we're talking about stuff like where an NFT could be useful, right? Like you could have a long-term offtake project that's its representation is turned into an NFT that's tradable. And so now you could bring liquidity to a project where there wasn't any before. And I'll give you a very specific concrete example. of so people are like, why the hell is this guy talking about oceans and NFTs, right? Like if I'm a project developer and I, maybe I live, you know, uh, in India along the coast of the Sundarbans, uh, which is actually a place where there are blue carbon projects being developed, right? Um, I want to develop a mangrove project that requires planting a bunch of mangrove trees. It requires a bunch of uh, stewarding these trees over time, et cetera. I have to find the labor, I have to find the trees, I have a ton of costs up front. And now I want to say to someone, great, hey, you know what? Jihad mortgages have existed forever. Why can't they just get one? Absolutely they can, right? So 
the so a you know let's say a big corporate purchaser like uh, mastercard or something goes yeah let's invest in some let's do some mangrove projects right there but they want to say like how many credits am i going to get in the future when you plant this what am i going to get right. in year three four five we can answer that question roughly maybe within a five to you're going to laugh at five to 30 percent error maybe right it's actually wide it's wide range right <laughs> But it's still okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Sure. We're doing something, right? So what you do is you're the project developer. You go, I'm going to sell you the first three years of what we think the project will deliver at a 50% discount. You pay that up front, right? Great. Mm -hmm. And then MasterCard goes, now the CFO at MasterCard or the CFO's office goes, yo, I'm what if sell these... this, right? <laughs> exactly. What if these people suck at this and I have a bad asset? Can I trade it? And like right now, so the answer is not really. But this is where like crypto, NFTs, mm -hmm. deeply liquid mm -hmm. markets are interesting is that if you have some of these other technologies we're talking about, like AI or even just remote monitoring, right? Like other things like that, that can say, hey, what's the thickness of that tree? What was the thickness of this tree in the last six months? Is the tree still there? If you can answer that question, you could have an Oracle that accepts that data and updates right. the value of that credit. Now not just the credit, the project, right? And now if the project is an NFT and it's constantly being updated and you have a pool of forward contracts that everyone of that methodology across that region or across that world participates in, then now, well, you have yourself a forward market, right? And now this enables you to say, to find out things like who is a good project developer? <laughs> what are the successful projects that are happening? Who's being traded the most? Who's, well, who's being dumped on? And you then also create some demand. You, you fulfill the demand for people who are like, I want to actually support these projects and make and claim impact, environmental impact, right? And that's that's where I think the innovation needs to happen and still isn't necessarily happening as fast as possible. I don't think it needs to happen at this magical, like cybernetic nature, like level where we're like controlling it all, like, you know, Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I mean, for sure, what comes to mind at this point is IoT. IoT for measurement, uh, yep. drone, a swarm of drones that go and take aerial uh, imagery yeah. to be elaborated and things like That's that. That's happening too, right? Like, right. And, uh, yeah. see, because, I mean, at the end of the day, you say mangrove, which is a little bit uh, like one foot on the water, one foot out. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, exactly. it's, it's easy because it's measurable as much as the green carbon, right? But uh, when it comes to full ocean, uh, full, uh, you know, I, I live in Bali in Indonesia and mm -hmm. uh, sometimes going to nearby island, there is a huge growth of uh, algae that they do it uh, simply to make uh, beauty creams or product of other sort. Uh, but uh, you see, yeah, but you see the extent of this, uh, which is probably is a micro dot in the ocean, but uh, probably without realizing they're contributing in their own way to have uh, a mechanics that helps, right? And it's not so difficult, it's relatively expensive to do. So even in the coastal areas, uh, is it mangrove? It is, uh, you know, uh, a byproduct of uh, some other activity. They have in their hands something that can monetize as well, right? If tomorrow they say, look, we're doing this, we're already doing this for 15 years. We're going to do it for the next 50, right? Uh, with For doing yeah. our beauty product, we are contributing this in terms of blue carbon. And uh, we can also resell this, right? Uh, if uh, it's uh, measurable and, and valid. Yep, exactly. And I think like, that's the thing, right? This is what's interesting. This is the stuff. Well, I'll tell you, I can't tell who said this, but like, I was extremely excited talking to an institutional, uh, to, a, to a financial institution yesterday, where these folks were saying, um, they were looking at solutions for their asset managers, where their asset managers wanted to know, hey, ooh, we've been giving some loans out to, you know, um, uh, as if farmers and real, when, I, when I say farmers, farmers like, oh, you mean like, you know, the one I'm like, no, I'm talking about like 50,000 hectare gigantic farms, like corporations or, right. right. And, and like, we, we've been doing our like, you know, by, by annual check-ins with them. And they told us that they were able to sell credits in two areas and they were like super, they were, you know, they were yeah. excited about being able to double sell their credits. So, so then like, I was asking, I was like, so what made you, what did you do about that? Did you go and try to find out like where they sold them and like what's going on? They're like, yeah, well, what we were really searching for as a solution, as a financial institution was something that prevents double spending and something that gives, <laughs> and that gives us right. immutability of data. And I was like, 
Hunt and Blood Sane. <laughs> but it's funny. I didn't have to say it. They were already working with a blockchain data provider as a bank. And I was like, that's huge. And not enough people are talking about this, right? Because that becomes the real promise of the space is that people are like, what should we be doing about, what should we be doing about blue carbon? What should we be doing about this, that, and the other? And I'm like, dude, we already have the solution. We just need to adopt this. <laughs> right. right. And that's, uh, that's very interesting. It, it's, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We're at the end uh, of uh, our, uh, our time, uh, but uh, uh, it is uh, an interesting new planet, uh, surely bigger than all the green carbon, but uh, more difficult to manage uh, and measure. And uh you don't know, I, I, I'm interested to see in the future how these things develop. And, uh, you know, maybe we have another chat. Uh, I don't think. Oh, well, let me show a little bit for you. If you're interested sure. in this stuff, you should check us out um, on uh, Cerulean underscore XYZ on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Against Utopia, at Against Utopia. And then also, we invest in a number of companies who are doing this stuff. So we are looking really closely at Ocean MRV. We're looking, we already have a bunch of investments in nature-based solutions on land MRV. And so I think if you're interested in this space, come find us, come, you know, come, come uh, post, <laughs> join the rest of us posters, eternal posters. You can't get off Twitter um, and, uh, and also on LinkedIn. Um, and we are constantly sharing information on nature data, nature markets, and all the developing standards in the space, especially on blue carbon. There's an upcoming in September, as we get closer to COP and as we get closer to Client Week NYC, there's going to be a new release from the task force on nature-related financial disclosures, where they'll be basically announcing a bunch of new banks and financial institutions who will be adopting standards around blue carbon and around reporting of nature risks that then is tied to nature data. And I think like we've talked about, man, blue carbon, green carbon, whatever it is, it's really all about how are we measuring it and how are we financing it? And now we don't double spend it. <laughs> and how we, exactly. And we're and and people who you know whatever your views on blockchain are, uh, I'm a block, kind of a maximalist myself. But you know, um, there's a clear use case for it, and it doesn't. Yeah. I don't need to be saying it anymore. Right. I'm not the right. One but unfortunately, unfortunately, there is still a master that when they hear blockchain, they think uh, oh, bad stuff. No, no, it's an instrument. It's a piece of software. How you use yeah. it can be good or bad. Exactly. And for sure, for the carbon credit, is a perfect marriage. Thank you again for being with us, Jahed. Uh, this is Roberto Capodieci. This was a Breaking Bank Europe episode 184. And uh, see you guys soon again. Thanks for listening to Breaking Banks Europe, a Provoke Media podcast in cooperation with Fintech Stage. Don't forget to tweet us out, shout out, or post to the team at Breaking Banks EU on Twitter. If there's something or someone you'd like to hear on our cast, let us know. See you next week on Breaking Banks Europe.